Hello students and welcome back to Political Science 1513.w1, American Federal Government Online. You're going to be surprised to hear this, but uh, I'm your professor, Connor Alford. All right, all right. So uh, this week we're going to begin the first entry in a three-part series where we start to talk about political intermediaries. So I'm going to introduce you to the concept of political intermediaries. We're going to talk about the three main types of political intermediaries. And then we're going to go into a little bit more detail by breaking down one particular type of political intermediary that you need to be familiar with. And that, of course, is going to be the interest group. So let's begin with our learning objectives. Number one, explain the core concept of a political intermediary and the role that these institutions play in the democratic process. Number two, identify the three main types of political intermediary in American politics and describe the main differences that we can use to distinguish between them. Number three asks for you to describe the main strategies interest groups utilize in order to influence the policies produced by government decision makers, whereas our fourth learning objective asks for you to distinguish between insider and outsider lobbying tactics and to be able to identify examples of each. Next, we explain the concept of a collective action problem and in particular the free rider issue and then we're going to talk about how interest groups face these problems and how they are able to overcome them finally we're going to close by talking about the three main types of selective incentive that motivates individuals to participate in interest groups and we're going to identify examples of each so these are our learning objectives. These are the things that you ought to be able to do before the end of lecture today. And we're going to go ahead and get started with that first learning objective. So let me begin by giving you a definition. A political intermediary might be defined as an institution or an organization that helps to facilitate collective communication between the government and the people. So in other words, these are groups that we can take part in, which will help us to gather information about our leaders or to gather information about ourselves, which we can then send to our leaders. In other words, they're channels of communication. These are the devices, the institutions, the organizations that we, the American people, and we, the people of democracies worldwide, use to organize collective action and send messages to voters as well as to our political leaders. The three main types of political intermediary that are going to operate in American politics today are the political party, the interest group, and the mass media. So let's talk about each of these in turn. A political party is a group of political activists who organize to win elections, operate government, and gain direct control over public policy. The key points here are that political parties in our country are primarily electoral organizations. Their main goal is to win elections so that they can operate government and therefore have a direct hand in shaping the policies that govern our country. Interest groups are different. An interest group is an organized group of individuals making policy-related appeals to the government. And then, of course, we've got the media. The media is a channel of communication. Now, when we're talking about political organizations and intermediaries, we're particularly interested in mass media. A mass medium is a channel of communication that reaches a very large audience. And of the various mass media that operate in our country, music, video games, television, so on and so forth, the most important for political purposes is arguably going to be the news media. And the news media is a form of mass media. A mass medium, again, is just a channel of communication reaching a large audience. So a news media or medium is a channel of communication that reaches a large audience and, in addition to that, routinely conveys political information. So again, the three main types of intermediary are political parties, interest groups, and the mass media. All three of these are organizations which help to facilitate collective communication between the people on one hand and those that rule over us on the other hand. So for example, if we were to look at political parties, we know that joining a political party sends a message. If you register as a Republican, you are conveying to our political leaders that you would like to see our government taken in a more Republican direction. If you register as a Democrat, then you are again sending a message to our political leaders that you would like them to support Democrat Party policies. 
But the opposite is also true. When a candidate decides to declare themselves a Republican or a Democrat, they are sending a message to their voters. They are making a claim that they support a certain platform of issue positions or a certain set of core values and ideas about government and politics. Now, do be honest with yourself and acknowledge that not everyone who registers as a Republican before running for office is genuinely Republican or everyone who registers as Democrat is genuinely Democrat. These are tools that our leaders can use to send information to us, but that information isn't always going to be honest. There are some politicians who tend to hold left-wing or Democratic ideas but call themselves Republicans and vice versa, and usually this is because doing so is handy for the purposes of getting elected. Now, when we're talking about interest groups and mass media, again, we're using these as collective institutions that help to facilitate communication. So, for example, if we're talking about the media, then you know that most of us learn about how our members of Congress have voted on an issue or something that the president has done recently, not because we know the president or our congressperson personally and can ask them, but because it gets covered by the media, on television, the radio, in the newspaper, or via the internet. For many of you, probably your main source of media information is social media. But one way or the other, these are all tools that you can use to gather information about your political leaders. At the same time, political leaders are going to use our social media behavior to learn about us so they know which voters to reach out to and which voters to ignore. And they're going to use things like cable broadcasts covering mass protests to learn how people are responding to their actions in government. So again, all three of these are different types of political intermediary. They are not the same thing. They are not synonymous. Interest groups and political parties we are going to find are not identical, but they are similar in that they both serve as organizations or institutions which help to facilitate collective communication between the government and the people. So what are the differences? If we know that both parties and interest groups are in fact types of political intermediary, what separates them? Why are they categorized distinctly? Well, the primary distinction, the most important distinction between political parties and political interest groups that you need to know is that political parties are electoral organizations. And that means that their primary goal is to get their members elected into office. So political parties are distinct from interest groups first and foremost in that they actually run their candidates. Interest groups might try to influence the candidates that are being run by political parties, but they will not themselves run an official candidate. That doesn't mean they won't endorse candidates. They do endorse candidates. And that doesn't mean that they don't fund or support candidates. They do support and fund candidates on a regular basis. But they do not run their own people in elections. So, for example, in 2016, the presidential candidates were Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. And of course, we had some third-party candidates like Gary Johnson, but they didn't do particularly well. So let's focus on the two frontrunners, Clinton and Trump. Hillary Clinton was the Democratic political party's official candidate because she was selected by Democratic voters in their primary. Similarly, Donald Trump won the Republican primary, and therefore he was the Republican candidate for office. Note that the Democratic Party and the Republican Party are both political parties and not interest groups because they have run their own candidates. Now, Hillary Clinton was endorsed by a large number of interest groups, and so was Donald Trump. Hillary Clinton did receive the support and the financial backing of large-scale organizations like Planned Parenthood, an interest group. And even though Planned Parenthood did a lot to help her get elected, understand that she was not the Planned Parenthood candidate, she was the Democrat candidate. She was endorsed by Planned Parenthood, she got a lot of help from Planned Parenthood, but officially she was the Democratic Party's nominated candidate. Similarly, Donald Trump had a lot of support from groups like the NRA, but at the end of the day, Donald Trump was not nominated by the NRA, he was nominated by the Republicans. So officially, he was the Republican Party's candidate. All right, so that's the first difference. Uh, parties run their candidates, interest groups don't. All of the other differences are, at the end of the day, going to be a consequence of this first and most important distinction. But the second most important distinction between parties and interest groups is that political parties exert direct control over public policy, whereas interest groups only indirectly influence public policy by persuading or informing government decision makers. 
So remember that political parties run candidates in elections. And that means that they have an opportunity to win seats in government. And if you have taken control of the government by winning enough elections, then you're the one who gets to write the public policies that operate our country on a day-to-day -day basis. So for example, in 2016, Republicans took the United States House of Representatives, the United States Senate, and they took the White House. That means that they had a majority in both chambers of Congress and that we had a Republican president. And that lasted for about two years. So during those two years, Republicans were essentially in control of the American government. They ultimately had the power to write all of the laws that went into effect and to block all of the proposed laws that did not go into effect. They directly controlled. They had direct power over public policy. Interest groups do not. They have no lawmaking authority because they have not run candidates and therefore they have not won in any elections. Without winning elections, you have no lawmaking authority, and therefore interest groups have to rely on their ability to influence those people who have won elections. So they're definitely still important. They definitely still play a very big role in shaping what laws pass and what laws fail. But they do this by persuading or informing the people in office. They don't get to make their own laws, but they can ask people in office to make laws on their behalf, or they can influence the types of laws that the people in office are creating by lobbying them, by providing them with certain types of information, services, or electoral support. All of these are ways in which interest groups can indirectly influence public policy, but only political parties run their candidates, and therefore only political parties actually have direct control over government. So. The third major difference between interest groups and political parties is that political parties tend to have generalized agendas, whereas interest groups very frequently specialize and focus on one or two major issues. An example of this might be Americans United for Life, which is a pro-life organization. It is an interest group that focuses purely on promoting pro-life policies. Similarly, NARAL, the National Abortions Rights League, is a pro-choice lobbying interest group and that means that they are basically there to promote pro-choice policies. You don't have a major political party that focuses specifically on abortion. Neither the Democrats nor the Republicans make that their single interest and the reason that they're going to have such generalized agendas that they can't just focus on one issue they care really strongly about is again that they need to win elections and if you want to win elections it's not enough to just get the pro-life people or the pro-choice people to vote for you you have to get a whole host of different people from various walks of life to come and cast their votes for you and that means that you've got to take issues on i'm sorry you've got to take positions on the issues that all these different groups care about so for example if a candidate told you that they agreed with you on abortion, you might be pleased, but you probably wouldn't be willing to vote for them if that's all they told you and they refused to disclose where they stood on any other issue. If they didn't tell you where they stood on taxation, foreign policy, so on and so forth, you would probably be a little suspicious and unwilling to cast your vote in their behalf. So that's because you care about more than just one or two issues. Voters have broad interests. They're interested in a whole bunch of different topics, issues, and problems. And therefore, in order to get their support and win elections, political parties have to adopt what we call a party platform. And a party platform is a generalized agenda. It's a long list of statements identifying where the party officially stands on a whole host of different issues. Interest groups don't have to have a generalized agenda. Some of them choose to do so, but they're not required to do so because they don't need to win elections, and that means that they can afford to specialize by focusing on particular issues without worrying about an electoral backlash. Therefore, we find, again, lots and lots of interest groups with specialized agendas, but not very many political parties with specialized agendas. And what we do find is that when a party with a specialized agenda does form, say the Green Party, which focuses essentially all of its time and energy talking about the environment, they fail miserably. The Green Party hasn't really won any elections because it's not taking any positions on a whole host of issues that Americans care about. All right. Those are the three most important, the three biggest differences between interest groups and political parties, but there's one last set of distinctions that we need to talk about. Interest groups do not have the same legal advantages that the major political parties have when it comes to elections. So political parties 
at least the Republican and Democratic parties, have legal advantages in elections that interest groups do not enjoy. For example, if you wanted to run for an office in the state of Oklahoma, but you were not a Republican or a Democrat, you were, say, a member of the Green Party or you were a member of the Oklahoma Second Amendment Association, then you would be free to do so. But before your name appears on the ballot, you'd have to get a certain number of signatures, and it's not a particularly easy number to satisfy. It's a very large number, and all of these signatures have to come from valid registered voters in our state. So you are going to start your campaign by getting people to sign a sheet of paper authorizing the government to put you on the ballot. But if you're Republican, or if you're the Democratic candidate, you don't need to get these signatures. You're automatically placed on the ballot, giving you a head start. That's an advantage that is legally reserved to the major parties and denied to everybody else, including interest groups. So that, too, is another difference, albeit a somewhat minor one, which we can use to distinguish between interest groups and political parties that operate in the American political arena. But we're not here today to talk about political parties. That's going to be later this semester. For now, we're here to talk about interest groups. So let's narrow that scope and let's start to talk about the primary functions that interest groups fulfill in our democratic process. And the first of the two primary functions that the interest groups are going to fulfill in our democracy are that they promote special interests. What does it mean to promote a special interest? Well, a special interest is something that a specific component of the population cares about, but that the general public is not necessarily all that concerned with. You can contrast a special interest with a general interest. A general interest is a want or need shared by pretty much the entire population to more or less the same extent. We all have pretty much the same level of interest in maintaining national security and ensuring that we don't get nuked into the Stone Age. But there are some issues that have a bigger impact on certain segments of the population than others, or that certain segments of the population feel more strongly about than others, and those are special interests. So, for example, you could argue that women have a special interest in ensuring easy contraceptive access. Because unlike men, women have ovaries and women can get pregnant. And therefore, it is arguably true to say that women are more directly and more immediately impacted by a lack of access to contraception than are men. Now again, that doesn't mean that men don't care. Of course, men also have some interest in being able to control when they become fathers. But their interest is perhaps not as steep as what we observe among women. And so there are interest groups that focus specifically on promoting access to contraception, and many of these are women's groups. So again, interest groups help to promote special interests, and this is somewhat controversial. Because what we're going to discover is that some interest groups are really, really good at promoting special interests. And what that means is that sometimes the government becomes more responsive to certain special interests than to the general interest. And that can be a problem because remember that in a democratic society, the idea is that we have government for the people. Not for some segments of people within the broader population, but for the people as a whole. For the general interest, not the special interest. And sometimes the special interest is incompatible with the general interest. What's in the best interest of a particular group and what's in the best interest of the nation as a whole aren't always going to align. And when that happens, there's a presupposition that the government should side with the general interest, that it ought not prioritize the few over the many. But in reality, the few are sometimes very, very good at mobilizing, whereas the many are not. And therefore, sometimes the government gives those interest groups what they want, pandering to the special interest at the expense of the country as a whole. So yeah, that, that, that's controversial. That's probably a problem for a lot of people. However, it's important to understand that many of these special interests are nevertheless very legitimate concerns and that they do warrant some government decision. And quite frequently, they would be ignored altogether if it weren't for special interest groups that could keep the government in the loop and mobilize the government in addressing problems faced by certain segments of our population, but not necessarily visible to the public at large. So, for example, Native Americans only make up about 0.2% of the general population in our country. And what that means is that through regular elections, they don't really have enough power in voting to sway the outcome most of the time. 
And if they don't have enough numbers to sway the outcome of an election, there's no built-in incentive for political leaders to pay attention to what they want or need. But they do have legitimate wants and needs that are peculiar to their communities that do deserve some government attention. They have concerns with things like tribal sovereignty and cultural survivability. And these are all things that the general public may be perfectly happy to help them with, but we wouldn't even know that they were having problems if it weren't for interest groups that could promote those special interests by keeping the public and our political leaders informed. So this is a very controversial function, but not necessarily bad. I'll let you decide whether you think it's good or bad, but just understand that it does sometimes mean the government's going to pander to the few and not the many, and yet it also means that some groups of traditionally disenfranchised people suddenly have an avenue to representation in government that they might not otherwise enjoy. That's the first primary function of the interest group, to promote special interests. But it's also important to understand that interest groups help to facilitate collective action. Now again, they're going to facilitate this collective action in the interest of shaping public policy so that it responds more to the particular wants, needs, and expectations of a particular segment in our population. But what we're going to find is that these interest groups are nevertheless very important in facilitating collective action independent of those special interests because it means that there are certain people who are getting engaged in the political process that might otherwise feel disenfranchised and simply stay at home. So it promotes civic engagement and perhaps that's a positive good in and of itself. I'll let you decide. Those are the two primary functions. They want to promote special interests, and they want to be facilitative of collective action. But how do they go about facilitating this collective action in order to promote government policies that support their special interests? Well, generally speaking, what we're going to discover is that interest groups have three major strategies, and that these can be classified as lobbying, electioneering, or litigation. So we're going to talk about each of these in turn, and we're going to start with lobbying. Lobbying is basically an attempt to influence public policy by persuading or informing government decision makers. So in a sense, we all lobby. When you cast a vote, you are trying to persuade or inform government decision makers to support certain types of policies. If you vote Republican, you're trying to persuade our government decision makers to support Republican policies. If you vote Democrat, again, you're trying to persuade our government decision makers to vote Democrat. You're also communicating. You're sending a message. When you vote for one party, you send a message that you support that party's platform. When you vote for the other party, the same message is being sent in the opposite direction. So in a sense, again, we all lobby. If you call your congressperson, you're lobbying. But do keep in mind that there is a difference between the sort of amateurish day-to-day quote-unquote lobbying that the average American voter does and professional lobbying in the same sense that there is a difference between singing in the shower and being a singer. If I told you I was a singer, that would give you the impression that I did that as a living, and that's simply not true, because the sounds that I make when I try to sing are enough to cause people great agony, and nobody wants to hear that. So I'm not a professional singer, but I do belt it in the shower. Similarly, I'm not a lobbyist, but I do try to persuade government decision makers when I have the opportunity to do so, and I feel that it is necessary in order to promote an important value or to advocate for an issue position that I feel very strongly about. Again, we all lobby in some sense, but professional lobbying and day-to-day -day lobbying are distinct. Interest groups tend to rely primarily on professional lobbying, whereas the average American citizen doesn't really have the money, time, or resources available for that. Interest groups can also engage in electioneering when lobbying doesn't work. So remember, lobbying is when an interest group goes to a government decision maker and tries to convince this individual to use his or her power in a certain way to promote a certain policy that will support a particular interest. But what happens when you go to that government decision maker and he or she is unwilling to listen to you? You can't persuade them. No information will change their mind. Well, then the next best thing is to replace that individual who is being recalcitrant with somebody who will be more amenable to your wants, needs, and expectations. So if lobbying is when you attempt to influence somebody who is already in government, then electioneering 
is when you support candidates running for office through financial contributions or by getting members to vote for them in order to replace people in government who aren't supportive of your wants, needs, and expectations with people who are. So lobbying says reach out to the people currently in power and try to convince them to support you. Electioneering says let's use our power over the electorate to change who's in government altogether because we can't really work with the people who are in office or we're not satisfied with them and think that we could do better by replacing them. Finally, we have litigation. And litigation is when an interest group takes a legal action before a court in order to enforce a particular right or interest or to get the courts to support a special privilege reserved to a particular segment of the population. Now what we're going to find is that there are many different ways in which interest groups can engage in lobbying, electioneering, or in litigation. And we're also going to discover that these are not necessarily mutually exclusive. So for example, when an interest group like Planned Parenthood or the NRA files an amicus brief, an advisory opinion, to the United States Supreme Court, this is a form of litigation because they are taking a legal action when they file that amicus brief before the court. But they're also lobbying because what do those amicus briefs do? Well, they provide the judges, government decision makers, with information in an attempt to persuade the decision makers to use their power in a certain way. Litigation and lobbying are not mutually exclusive. They overlap. So these are broad strategies that interest groups can use, but do understand that they are not hard and fast divisions. It is possible to lobby and electioneer and litigate all at the same time. Or, alternatively, it is possible to lobby but not to electioneer or litigate, to litigate but not electioneer or lobby, so on and so forth. You get the picture. But I do also want to make sure that we understand that in the case of lobbying, there are two broad subcategories that you need to be familiar with. So there are two major types or approaches to lobbying, two major strategies for the lobbying organization. And these two strategies are what we call direct or insider lobbying or indirect outsider lobbying. What's the difference? Well, direct lobbying is when you or a representative that you have hired attempt to persuade or inform government decision makers directly. And some examples of how you might attempt to persuade or inform a government decision maker directly in an insider lobbying technique might be, oh, say, researching and writing legislation on behalf of a congressperson or going to testify before a congressional committee or going and speaking directly to a judge or going and speaking directly to a bureaucrat over in the Environmental Protection Agency. These are all government decision makers, and if you speak directly to them in an attempt to influence how they wield their power, that's direct lobbying. Another form of direct lobbying that borders on electioneering is when interest groups provide sticks and carrots to help incentivize leaders to support them and disincentivize leaders from opposing their agenda. A really, really common example of offering sticks and carrots is when interest groups like Oklahoma Second Amendment Association, NARAL, or Americans United for Life release what we call report cards. A legislative report card is basically a report card that grades a political figure from an F to an A, the same way that you would grade a student, based on how well that particular legislator has supported a specific political interest. So the Oklahoma Second Amendment Association grades every legislator in the state of Oklahoma's Congress based on how well they have supported the Second Amendment. For them, being a pro-Second Amendment organization, an A means that the legislator has been very, very good on that issue, has promoted lots of access and lots of protection for gun rights, whereas an F means that they've been more amenable to gun control. And you could also find anti-gun groups like Moms Demand Action who will publish report cards that use the opposite scheme. But one way or the other, what they're trying to do with these particular mechanisms, these report cards, is reward politicians who support them with positive assessments and punish politicians who oppose them with negative assessments so that their voters know where to send money and how to cast ballots. All right, so those are direct lobbying techniques or what we call insider lobbying. 
There's also what we call indirect techniques or outsider lobbying. And outsider lobbying is basically when you are a representative attempt to get people in the general public to persuade or inform government decision makers on your behalf. And some examples of these types of outsider lobbying techniques include running television advertisements or endorsing or criticizing an elected official or policy, uh, organizing protests, letter writing campaigns, getting people to call their senators, so on and so forth. These are all different ways in which you can attempt to mobilize the public to persuade, inform, or pressure political leaders so that they comply with your wishes. Indirectly, you're still getting what you want, but you're working through the people instead of trying to go directly to a political leader. Now, it's important to understand that we do know that direct lobbying techniques tend to be more effective, that when you can speak directly to a political leader yourself, you're more likely to succeed than when you have to work through outside parties. However, the problem with insider techniques is that before you can reach out directly to, say, the President of the United States, you have to have enough contact and enough money in order to actually establish a face-to-face. -face. It's not very easy for people who don't have a lot of connections or money to get in a room with President Donald Trump. But if you're a billionaire or you represent a massive corporation, bank, interest group, or union, it might be more feasible for you to speak directly to a president, congressperson, or high-level bureaucrat. So the advantage to these direct techniques is that they tend to be more effective, but the disadvantage is that they're only available to moneyed interests. They require access, and access usually means money. You can gain money to political leaders if you have the ability to raise money for them. Outsider lobbying techniques are not always as effective. They're a little bit harder to predict because now you've got to work with the public. But they are easier and more affordable because pretty much anybody has the ability to go out in the streets and start talking to voters. So now we know about the different types of lobbying that interest groups can use. And we know about what lobbying, electioneering, and litigation entail. But the next topic we're going to have to discuss is what we call the collective action problem. And in particular, there's a specific type of collective action problem, the free rider issue, that we need to be attentive to. A collective action problem, if you don't recall, might be defined as any dilemma that occurs when rational individuals stand to benefit from working together but nevertheless fail to do so. So again, this is really just a situation where people aren't doing a good job of being team players. We're not cooperating, even though the group as a whole would probably benefit from cooperation. So for example, the most prevalent and the most problematic of all collective action problems when it comes to interest groups is what we call the free rider issue. The free rider issue, in turn, can be defined as a particular type of collective action problem which occurs when some people who stand to benefit from a project do not contribute their fair share of the costs because they believe that others will complete the project anyway. And this becomes an issue when those others, seeing that some people are not paying their fair share, also refuse to do the work to cover the costs and as a result nothing gets done. And this is going to be a problem when we're trying to acquire a public good. A public good is a good or service from which everyone benefits regardless of who pays for it. You can contrast this with a private good, which is a good or service from which only those who have paid the costs benefit. So what we're going to find is that because interest groups are trying to promote special interests by controlling public policy, all of the goods they are advocating for are public goods. So, for example, if we're talking about an environmental interest group and the public good that they're trying to acquire is clean air, what we're going to find is that not everyone's going to contribute to that interest group's efforts, but that if they succeed in getting clean air, we're all going to benefit. And this creates a temptation to be a free rider, to try and get the benefits of that environmental organization's lobbying efforts without yourself having to pay the cost. You can think of the free rider issue in terms of a group assignment at your local high school. We've all been there. You and some other students are put together in a group and you are asked to complete a project. 
but the grade that you receive is a public good, meaning that it doesn't matter who does most of the work. Every member of the group gets the same grade at the end of the day. And what always winds up happening is that one person does all the work while the rest sit around on their thumbs, and then everybody gets the same grade. Well, the free rider issue emerges when that one kid who's been doing all the work says, you know what, if you're not going to do the work, I'm not going to do the work either, and then we will all fail together. And so everybody fails. Now, if each member of the group would have just contributed their fair share of work, it would have been better for everybody. All of the students could do better from contributing some work so that they can pull together with a decent grade. But because most members of the group believe that that one person will do all the work, whether they contribute or not, they sit around, and this creates the free rider issue. And interest groups, again, have to deal with that because all of the public policies they're promoting are going to affect the general public, regardless of whether or not you have personally contributed to it. So let's say we're not talking about an environmental organization. Let's say we're talking about the National Rifle Association. We're talking about an organization that promotes more permissive gun policies. And let's say, for the sake of our example, that you are a gun collector and that you own a gun store and that you firmly support the Second Amendment and the right to keep and bear arms. Great. Okay, so you clearly have an interest in the success of the NRA since the NRA is promoting policies from which you benefit and that you believe to be ideologically agreeable. But if the NRA reached out to you and asked you for money and you said no, that doesn't mean that they're going to stop trying to promote those policies. They're just going to go and ask somebody else for the money. And they're going to keep going and they're going to keep asking until eventually somebody says yes. So why should you pay for their lobbying efforts when you get the benefit of those lobbying efforts regardless of whether the money comes from you or somebody else? Why not be a free rider? Why, in other words, buy the cow if you get the milk for free? So interest groups have to find ways to overcome the free rider issue. And for our learning objectives, you need to understand that they are able to do this by promoting what we call selective incentives. And selective incentives are also sometimes referred to as selective benefits because these are the private goods, the private benefits, which motivate individuals to take part in interest group activities. So remember, we're all going to get some general public benefits from the lobbying efforts of interest groups, but that if they want us to participate, instead of waiting to let somebody else cover the costs or make the contributions or do the work for us, then they need to give each individual a reason why he or she should personally contribute. And they're going to do this by offering either material incentives, solidary incentives, or purposive incentives. These are also called material benefits, solidary benefits, and purposive benefits. And again, they're all types of selective benefit or selective incentive, meaning that they are particular benefits that an interest group can offer as a way to motivate a particular individual to take part in its efforts at altering public policy. What are the three types of selective incentive and how are they distinct? Well, remember the first type of selective incentive or selective benefit is the material benefit. And material benefits are goods, they are economic goods and services that a member receives in exchange for their participation in a particular organization. So for example, the American Association for Retired Persons or AARP is one of the most powerful interest groups in our country. And a part of what makes this organization so successful is that it offers a lot of material benefits to people who join and begin paying dues as members of that organization. And these members are willing to pay the monthly fees in exchange for the benefits of membership because the AARP offers material incentives. It, for example, provides discounts on prescription drugs and travel opportunities and life insurance. And these are all goods that elderly people that senior citizens want to acquire for themselves. So whether they agree with the agenda or the political values of AARP is no longer the central consideration. They're joining not necessarily because they believe in the organization, although I'm sure many of them do, but because it makes sense economically to do so. The costs of joining are more than offset by the benefits of membership. 
So that's what we're talking about when we talk about material benefits or material incentives. But interest groups can also motivate participation through what we call solidarity benefits or solidarity incentives. These should not be misphrased as solidarity benefits, although that term would probably also be appropriate. A solidarity incentive or benefit is a social, professional, or psychological gain that an individual derives from surrounding his or herself by like-minded individuals. So, for example, if you are a very liberal person, you'll probably find it comforting to join a liberal interest group where you can hear other people sharing your same beliefs and values. It makes you feel like you're not alone, it makes you feel like you're not crazy, and it makes you feel like there's actually some room to make progress on the issues that you care about. Similarly, conservatives tend to find it comforting to surround themselves by conservatives. We all love our own echo chambers, and the acquisition of an echo chamber is a type of solidarity benefit. But that's only one type or example of a solidarity benefit. Other examples include professional networking. If you are interested in pursuing a career in a legal field, I would highly recommend that you join an interest group that is interested in the particular wants, needs, and expectations of legal professionals. Because when you do that, you're going to meet a whole bunch of other attorneys and aspiring attorneys, legal position holders, judges, and so on and so forth. And some of those people may somewhere down the road be able to offer you a job or turn your attention to a job opportunity or help you get a promotion. That's a solidary benefit. It's a social or professional benefit that you get from surrounding yourself by other people who are like-minded in that they also want to pursue careers in the legal field. You can also get solidary benefits just from the social experience. So, for example, one lobbying organization that has a lot of members is the American Poker Players Alliance. And most of the members of this organization don't even realize that it's an interest group. They don't even realize that it lobbies the government. They're joining not because they care about its lobbying efforts, but because in exchange for paying membership dues, they gain access to a whole network of other people that are also enthusiastic about poker. They're not joining to support a cause. They're joining to find people to play cards with. And that's a solidary benefit. But what happens when you're an interest group that doesn't have the resources to offer material incentives and people aren't responding to solidary benefits? Well, in that case, you'll have to turn to what we call purposive benefits or purposive incentives. And purposive benefits are basically the psychological, moral, and ideological satisfaction that we derive from contributing to causes that we believe in. So sometimes people will choose not to free ride, even though they probably could, simply because they care that strongly about the issue. They want that badly to be a part of the solution, and they get a sense of moral satisfaction. They feel like they are completing their civic duty when they engage in these types of activities. And that works great for some interest groups. If you're dealing with a really controversial issue or an issue that people feel very strongly about, purpose of incentives might be all you need to motivate participation. So, for example, if we're talking about an abortion issue, feelings are so strong on this that a lot of people are willing to join, participate, and do work, even if they don't have to, even if somebody else might do that work on their behalf, and even if they're not getting anything in return, because they feel so strongly. If you're dealing with the issue of child abuse, people feel very, very strongly about that. But if you're dealing with turnip tariffs or the cost of Cuban cigars, that's a very niche issue and purposive incentives might not work as well for you, at least not on a large scale. So these are the three different types of incentive that interest groups can offer to members in order to motivate those individuals to participate, either by joining, by paying fees, by making donations, or by contributing time and effort. One way or the other, these are the tools that interest groups can use to overcome free writing a particular type of collective action problem so that they are able to engage in lobbying, electioneering, and litigation in order to promote special interests and facilitate collective action. And that's pretty much the end of this lecture, so I'll see you all next week.